station wagons and they all had that back back seat and sometimes it was fun to sit in the way way back but to some kids that was where they got sent because they were just in the way anyway how many of us have just been in the way growing up I know that I've been born from a place of children were seen and not heard to get out of the way this is adult time I watch myself catch myself just making sure she asked to excuse me or beg your pardon or can I say something for the old interruption thing. But I gotta make sure that I pay attention to Rose because it's been too long that all of us have felt this cast aside. You know, the way this movie opened and the way my poem opened was have you ever thought on a scale one to 10 what it is you thought you might be? And this kid was asked that by a stepdad or a step-boyfriend. It wasn't even a stepdad yet in the movie. But it doesn't matter who it is. Someone, somewhere, somehow has berated us, made us feel less than from the moment we entered the planet. You know, some of us may have had a wonderful life where our parents were just uplifting and wonderful every single day. And my hats are off to you. And I'm very grateful for you that that was the childhood that you discovered and had. Most of us in New Thought, I'm noticing, had a different life, had a different childhood. It doesn't take away from the wonder of our folks. It doesn't take away from the wonder and the love that we received. But somewhere along the line, we got put down way too much, way, way too much. We got made to sit in the back, back seat way too often. We got cast aside and berated and told, you're not going to mount to nothing. You're not going to do that. You're only a three. What could make you even think you could be a six? A six? Really? That's pretty high standards for you. And we bought into it somewhere along that line. We kept being told over and over again how much we were gonna amount to nothing, how little we were worth, how our value in this world was just about what we can do when we were told to do it. I know this is a hard one here, folks. This isn't a happy talk necessarily, but there's a happy outcome because you guys are all here. Something in your spirit's all led you to hear. I'm not going to get to the end yet because of what I see in the eyes before me. Because I'm seeing in a lot of little kids' eyes right now people getting plugged in to the shit that was given to us when we were kids. To the places. We were invalidated when we were just coming into the world and our spirit should have been shining. Instead, we got berated and put down and told how disgusting we were, how less than we were, how nobody was ever going to love us. They may not have said those words, but they sure did it in their actions, didn't they? Every time we were just ignored, every I love you that was missed, every time that we were just sent to our room without an explanation of what even just happened, all of us have gone through that some way, somehow. And there's room for forgiveness in all of this, but we have to own the hurt in this. We have to own that there's a little kid that lives inside of us still to this day that feels less than. And sometimes we have to do everything in our bodies to muster up the energy to get beyond that. To find that one person in life that lifts us up. That one person in life that shows us how to cut our own path and to quit being what everybody else told us to be or told us we were when they didn't have a clue who we were anyway. How the hell do they know? How the hell are they gonna know what it looks like to be me? I'm just still discovering it and I'm 50 years old. I bet you all of you are still discovering it. That's why we come to places like this and call it new thought, new discovery. I wanna find out all there is about myself. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And if some of the bad was put in me by people before, then so be it. I gotta deal with it. 
If I want to get to my God self, I've got to go through the crap too. But I've got to know that it wasn't true. These were lies that were told to us. These were lies that were told to little, little children because the parents or the elders or the boyfriends or the brothers and siblings or the friends just didn't know. They were too hurt and too afraid in their own self to be able to show you love in that moment. But that's what this journey is about for us. Constantly finding where that love is and going there. Sometimes you have to go to hell before you get to heaven. Steve Miller said that, I think, in a song. And it's true. And I know we've all lived in our own personal hell, and hell is just a state of mind, but sometimes that state is the only state you've ever lived in. Out of all the wonderful states there are, we stay stuck in this one because we just got berated for too long and too hard. It just got made to feel too terrible about ourselves. And sometimes you just got to pop out of it and you got to do the best you can. You have to just fake it till you make it sometimes. Even if you don't think it's true, do whatever you can to pop yourself out of this feeling. And find somebody in your world that's going to believe in you or help you believe in you. For me, when I was a kid, there was a, a young priest named Father Zapp in Salem, Ohio. He just inspired me. He was a good man. But he believed in me that was foreign. I didn't know anybody yet who did. I love my dad. I love my older brothers. That's the thing is what it is. But they didn't ever let me know that I was somebody who could achieve anything I th thought of. Or that if I just focused on something and kept trying and trying and trying, that I would do it. But this priest did. This priest started a youth group that made me meet other kids my age and a little bit older that gave me someone to look up to. So far, I hadn't. And again, it doesn't take away from my own brothers. I love them. They're my brothers. But that wasn't their job. They were little kids, too, also. And I could go look at my father's pain and forgive him for all that, which I did when I was very young, and forgave him before I did the work. And I forgave the pain of him before I did the work in me so I still walked on with low self-esteem anger and felt like I was unlovable and deserving of love and nope it didn't matter because no one loved me anyway to just be congruent with the evidence I had going on in my head all the unwords were being matched by what life was presenting to me I know now that we create this reality and that even if the script change came in and said, no, you're going to be alone for this part of your journey, that there was a reason for that. But it didn't mean I was unlovable. It didn't mean I was unworthy. It didn't mean that I was these things that would have me sitting in the way, way back, far away from where all the action is, far away from where the scene of life coming at me is. All I get to do is see where we just left. Well, I know what I just left. I left heartache. I knew it, you knew it. We had just been berated over and over and over again. Told that we weren't going to achieve anything. So what the hell is the journey about then? Breathing and discovering. Somewhere along the line, somebody made a difference for you. Even if it was just a little friend that said, no, you can do that. You see the shirt I have on? This is a birthday present last year. This is not my low self-esteem shirt. <laughs> but there'd be a point in my life that I could not get away with wearing something this bold and out loud. I, this is my prop for today. This shirt I wore on purpose. Because sometimes you just gotta be out there and you gotta be bold and you gotta wear something bolder than how you feel in the moment to pop you out of it. I used to dress in only dark clothing. Not that it's not in my wardrobe now, but I only allowed myself dark clothing. I never allowed myself bright colors, then they would see me. I can't let that happen. I was falling deeper and deeper into the shell that I had created. Now, some of life's pains are what they are. Someone, you know, I've shared with you my mom died when I was a kid and sure that made me sad and probably affected my self-esteem a little bit just in that happening. But when you're constantly being told 
that you're not going to amount to something, even if it's by actions and not by words. We can be neglected and abused just as much as if somebody was smacked around their whole lives. If we're just cast to the side and felt made to feel unimportant, where do you grow inside? Where does that light start sparkling and shining and coming from within? And then somewhere along the line, there was that one person. Again, for me, it was Father Zap, and then a guy that was in my youth group that at first hurt my feelings with something he said because I, I didn't really get the nickname. He, he called me Beef, and I was stocky as a kid, but I wasn't fat as a kid. Not then. I got I didn't gain weight until like my senior year, patting all my protect protecting myself from puberty and all the wonderful things that come with high school and the, and the journey I was just about to embark on in the Navy and I went from 155 my junior year to 240 pounds my senior year. Obviously I had issues <laughs> that I was protected because that's what weight gain means. But as a young kid, I wasn't really heavy, I was a little husky, they only did that husky, the husky size, but I wasn't a fat kid so when he called me beef I didn't get it and it hurt my feelings. But he was, trying, he was trying to compliment me like I was strong because he had just saw me do a bunch of strong things and I didn't know he was watching me. So I, we had this really long talk. Important moment in my life because it was a switch. It was when somebody believed in me. Somebody a little bit older because I was a young, young kid. I was like 10 or 11, but he was still a teenager, but I looked up to him because he was like 18. And of course, we, we all know the wisdom of 18-year-olds. <laughs> I used to have something in my office that says, hire a teenager while they still know everything. <laughs> but it was this moment that made me start feeling a little bit better about myself. Just, just a little, because I had a long way to go. And it probably took me to workshops to even start really feeling good about me. But what if you've never heard of a workshop? What if you never had somebody in your life that that fulfilled that moment for you. When do we go? When do we find that place where the love is? If you've waited till this far in your life, then, then you're here. When I look at you guys' eyes, I'm going where the love is. When I take that time to be with you, I'm going where the love is. You think I don't have hurt in my life? Do I think you don't have hurt in your life? Go where the love is. Go to my eyes too. Go to each other's eyes. It's like there's so many different things in this world that we get so afraid to talk with each other, to confront each other. Some crazy stuff on Facebook's been happening lately, but there's been one elemental truth there. It doesn't replace human contact. We are in a day and age where there's so much technology that you, we and you guys are losing and missing out on each other through texting and typing and emailing. I can't see your eyes in a text. You can't see mine. There's no way you're going to know how I truly felt unless you see my eyes. I, I don't want to write texts anymore unless it's a happy text. Happy birthday. That's the only text I want to write anymore because I, I mess them all up anyway. It, they never seem to get out of my body what I really was trying to say to the person, and then they end up getting hurt because they couldn't see the love. Even if we're mad at each other and we say and talk, but we're looking at each other's eyes, we can see the love. I'm gonna stay more present with you. I'm gonna be here now to find out what it is got hurt in the first place in this dance of us. And if I have real low self-esteem, I'm not going to want to look in your eyes. That's where you're going to have to look at me even harder and pull me out from my own fear and vice versa. If I know that you're scared and somewhere along the line someone told you that you weren't good enough, you didn't deserve to be here, you don't get to sit in the front seat. And I know that, I better damn make sure I look deep in your eyes and stay there and just stay there long enough to have you breathe and go, I am lovable, I am worth being looked at, I am worth someone showing me how wonderful I am. Sometimes you just have to take a challenge. 
Sometimes you just have to take a chance and jump out in life and do something that you had no idea. You had the audacity, the boldness, the power, the gumption, the tenacity to do it until you try it. Until you just jump out and do it. There was a scene in the movie where the kid just started working at this water park and that's what started helping him build his esteem up. And they were throwing him to the wolves, but in a good way. And they, they made him, you know, some people were, whatever you call it, break dancing or something. And is that what it's called? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How old am I? But anyway, in it, he was real shy, real nervous. He had never done anything like this. And they were kind of goading him because they wanted him to exercise a little bit of authority because it was unsafe practice for the water park. But it was a bunch of his peers. They were all kids his own age, and he already felt awkward and gawky, and he was going through puberty and liking girls and feeling unliked by them. Going every single perfect 13, 14-year-old stuff. We've all gone through it, but he's also got, got to go through it feeling berated more and more. But this guy he met that was his boss kept kept nudging him, just nudging him, just nudging him, just a little bit more. And he went in and did it, and at first started a little bit meek, but the kids were receptive. And the next thing they know, they said, well, we're not gonna listen to you unless you try to break dance too. And he probably had, a, he would look like me, break dancing, it would be very comical. <laughs> very, very comical. But he did it, and everybody clapped. And it raised him inside. He started believing in himself, and people smiled at him, and people were accepting him, and nobody was telling him he was nothing. Nobody was telling him he was a three. Everybody was saying, you can do this, do it, do it, try it, no, do it, no, I'll do it better than that. No, come on, do it, do it. Until he jumped in and did it, and he still looked all awkward doing it, but the smile on his face was priceless because he attempted to do something that he never dreamed he could have. There's many things in this life that I have not been able to do, but I've, but I've tried. And some things that I've not tried to do, I've heard that voice in my head say, just, just attempt it. Just see if you can. There's certain things about knowing your own limitations that's true, but trying, I mean, we can go all the way back to the Star Wars days with Yoda, no try, do, or whatever he was saying to him, but it's all part of the same thing. It's like, here's this little kid that met this guy that was so out there and zany that he broke all the rules that the kid knew. I'm doing something with Rose where she's already starting to to start this little thing of usuallys. Well, usually we, like, let's erase usuallys. Let's be in the moment. Let's take all those usuallys and, well, I won't say this to her, but just shit can them. <laughs> because we get so stuck in our usuallys that we, 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 we mold our own life and then we cast it and then we're stuck in it. And like, okay, that's who I am forever because that's usually what I do. That's always what I've done before. And so we're just going to be here. It's going to be a boring ass life. <laughs> and I'm really going to actually hurt my own spirit because in that my esteem starts getting lower because I, I'm not challenging myself. It's like when I first started speaking up here, just as a guest speaker here and there, it, I, I challenged myself to do something. And as I've been doing this more and more and more, I keep challenging myself. Sometimes I get told to do it, like, do this. And I'm like, what? All right. Okay, but if I didn't challenge myself, I wouldn't have discovered that I could do a talk without a book. I wouldn't have had the trust in myself to know that the words are going to be there because they're, they're going to be in everybody's eyes. And then when I first started this talk, I, a part of me wanted to back off because I saw all the fear of, I don't want to talk about this. This crap hurts. This was when I was a little kid and it made me feel like crap. Like I was never going to amount to anything. Like I didn't even deserve to be here. How many people have suicidal thoughts because other people made them feel like they didn't deserve to be walking on the planet? Well, that's not happening on my watch. It's like we have to look in each other's eyes to know that we are all on the planet together and we do deserve to be together and that if you're hurting, then come to someone. We have to be bold enough to go to each other and I, I'm telling myself this one too because I suck at this one, too. <laughs> <laughs> to be bold enough to say, I'm hurting, will you hug me? I'm sad, will you be with me? 
I'm lonely, will you come over? That's not very easy, is it? It's real easy said words in a talk. Now be in the emotion of it and call someone and say that. Your whole body's going to vibrate. It's going to be worse than that first call to a boy or girl when you were a teenager. Because that was easy compared to saying this. This is how I really feel. And then I'm telling on myself because I've been a good actor. I'm an, I'm an excellent actor. I have acted my whole life and half the people are like, Mark had issues? He was always so happy and go lucky. Yeah, I hid really, really well. But you can only hide so long and my closest friends would see it come out. They would see that hurt come out. They would see that insecurity come out. Some of the things that happened a couple, whatever, three weeks ago on my nice, wonderful, delighted trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still feel that. I don't like that stuff, by the way. Because it was yucky and it tapped me into some fear thoughts and it tapped me into a personality within me that I thought had long since been healed and was fine and just skiing out in life somewhere, just playing. And he's, he, no, he's like, no, I've been, I've been here the whole time. Just waiting for an opportunity to jump on your butt and make you afraid again. And it took the lot to do it, but it did it. And it tapped me into some old insecurities and it came up and I started voicing them. And Scott's like, wow, I haven't seen that guy for 20 some years. And that's okay, because it was only a nanosecond in the big picture. But the thing is what it is, and I have to own that within me is every hurt that ever happened to me. If I have the memory of all the joy, I have the memory of all the hurt as well, and I can bring the pain up right now, all I gotta do is dwell on it. All we gotta do is what we focus on is what we get. So if I wanna focus on my past pain, it will oblige me wonderfully it has no judgment whether it was supposed to never see me again or if it was supposed to come back and visit my life and walk with me every single day. It never has judgment. Neither does the love. Neither does the fear. There's no judgment with all these things. We're the ones who have judgment with it. But sometimes that judgment we have with it is because our innate body knows that it's stopping us from moving forward. It's stopping us from going where the love is. It's stopping us from looking in each other's eyes and knowing that if I'm safe here, but if I look away, that's where I'm going to get hurt. Do you guys know that? Do you know when you look away is when the pain happens? If we stay present with each other, we'll be okay. We'll just be okay. Even if it's the grievous, most grievous thing we're dealing with. Because there's a lot of grief going on. There's a lot of grief in this room right now. A lot of us have recently lost people. A lot of us have lost things in the past. Some of us are losing things in our own bodies, in our own health, in our own walk in this lifetime that we're seeing as lack because it's something I was abundant with yesterday and, and now I'm not. Well, I have to grieve that loss as well. But, and if I stay looking in each other's eyes, it's, it's going to be a lot easier. It's just going to be more simple because I have other hearts to look through and to look at so that I can truly say, I'm not alone. Fear wants to say, you're alone, you're alone, you're alone, you're alone. Every day of your life, fear wants to tell you, you're alone, you're alone, you're unworthy, you're alone, you're alone. Be careful what you listen to. And if you don't have a pair of eyes because you are alone in the moment, I, I best suggest that you go get to a mirror. I've been in a mirror a lot in the last couple of weeks. Some of it has looked really, really ugly to me because I don't want to see myself in that kind of pain. But the thing is what it is. If I want to see my eyes smile again, I better damn well sure be willing to look at my eyes while they're crying. But it's also been some solace too because your first love and your last love must always be self-love. Mark Twain said that and I've, I've said that before. So if I want to go where the love is, where's the most ultimate place I really need to go? Oh, right here into my own eyes, as lovely as your eyes are, to all look at. I've always said this in, 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 a, in a different way, that whomever I go to bed with, or not go to bed with tonight, I can guarantee I'll be there in the morning. So I better make sure that I take care of me. It's wonderful to take care of the yous out there, and I've always been real good at that, what I've really lacked in and sucked at and really needed the most practice in in all of my life 
was figuring out how to love this guy, what it takes to love him, what I have to do to go where the love is in me. I've told people that for me, my mission is to drop the dom on every single thing that I feel and tell on it because that I believe that it will be what keeps me from my God self. And if I want to lie to me, I can do that, but you can't fool your body and you can't fool spirit. I could try. So I'm always going to drop the dime on all the different things so that we can go where the love is. Go to our God selves that are fine, that are perfect. There's nothing to be fixed there. There's no one to, to adjust. Our God self is perfect. We are perfect. Like I was talking about a couple weeks ago and last week, the changes that need to be made in our lives and to accept that we're right where we're supposed to be all at the same time in all of this. That I may be feeling all these different feelings that, that I was cast aside, that I was put down, that I was made to sit in the way, way back. But it's a real interesting thing that the way this movie ended, because in the whole movie, the mother was starting to realize that this new boyfriend was a schmuck and it wasn't good for her or her son. But still, the kid was always in the way, way back until the very last scene. The mother left the front seat and climbed, climbed all the way to the back and sat with him to go where the love is because she realized that that's where the love was the most between her and her son. And she can have a boyfriend in the future and he's going to learn and grow to have girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever in this lifetime. But that the ultimate part of this journey for her, that she thought she was seeking love in this guy, and she started realizing how the love of her own son was waning and waning, and his own self-love was waning and waning. And he was looking her in the eyes and calling her out on some choices that she was making in her world because he, this guy was doing it to her too through cheating on her and things like that and, and, and it was just making her own self-esteem go down worse because at first she was accepting it. Well, that's, that's the only love I have, so uh, we'll just deal with that. How many of us have cheated ourselves out of love because, well, I'm getting some of it. I used to do it from the express, from the example of you're 60 minutes in an hour. And most of us in our lives have taken 50 minutes of crap for 10 minutes of love. I have. I've manifested girlfriends in my past that were very mean to me, very unloving to me. But I got 10 minutes of it. <laughs> my, my esteem was so low that I thought I was only worth 10 minutes of love. And even those 10 minutes weren't really what I wanted. It was a reasonable facsimile of love. Uh, it was what I thought love looked like. As I've grown older and just had 10 wonderful years with staff, whether we're gone separate or not, doesn't take away from the love that we've shared and the love I've been given and shared back and forth with her. That's been a wonderful growth in my life. It's been a wonderful healing for me. And there's still more healing to do. I'm still walking the planet. And now I'm walking the planet from this perspective. So I obviously have some lessons there to deal with. But I know where to go now. Now I know where to go. I know to go here, and here, and here, and so on, and so on, and to again remember to go into the mirror most of all. So many people are gonna tell you who you think you they think you are, and it's up to us to let them know. Nobody else has ever been more possible than before. I dare them to try, because I don't even know what it looks like sometimes. I don't know what it's gonna look like tomorrow. I can have a plan. I can surmise. I can focus and go, this is what I would like to be. This is how I would like to be tomorrow. But I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna discover it. And that's all any one of us can do, is discover who you are. And when you discover that, there's some dialogue in there that somebody put in from a long time ago that made me feel less than, that made me feel that I had to sit in a way, way back and it wasn't for fun. And I have to own that, and I have to deal with it, and I have to do the work. And there's many aspects, again, to do the work. As Marcy does a workshop, Scott and I do workshops. There's all kinds of workshop facilitators here. There's books, there's readings. <coughs> Tarot and things like that can, can help guide you 
astrology, with the accent on the wrong syllable, astrology can help guide you. All these things are guides for you to help you see within. None of it is a rule. Take the rule or snap it in half and throw it out the door, unless you're measuring something. Because what we do when we have these things, we this is who I am, we block ourselves in stone and now we're there forever. Because we heard somebody else say something. I did a talk last year called God's Guides and Gurus. And I said, be aware of where you let people lead you. Some of you might, some people have been led right into Auschwitz because they followed blindly what someone else told them they had to do. So be aware of who you're following. Always follow your heart and go where the love is. I hope it's not the awesome. Thank you. Yeah.
song.